Good evening. Tonight's webinar, Sonoma County Druggists and Pharmacies, will begin shortly. We have just opened up our Zoom doors and allowing our participants to enter our room. We are also being joined by our Facebook Live participants watching us simultaneously on Facebook Live. We'll give you a moment to enter into our webinar before we go over a few logistics before short, shortly starting our program. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. The Historical Society of Santa Rosa is proud to bring you our monthly webinar series, which I have to correct that real quick. It was monthly last year. We went to every other month and we've got some exciting news at the end of this webinar to share with you. So we hope that you join us throughout. Tonight, we're bringing you Sonoma County Druggists and Pharmacies featuring advertising, bottles, medicine, glasses, Photo photographs and local history. The presentation tonight will be by John C. Burton and I'll introduce him in just a moment. We wanna make sure that you realize that this is a fantastic book that you can get. And it, it's based, that this presentation is based on a fantastic book that you can get by none other than Frank A. Sternad and John C. Burton. So a little bit about our presenter tonight. He's a local bottle collector and historian, and he'll be presenting highlights from his book, as well as he had Frank A. Sternad help him to write the book about Sonoma County druggists featuring advertising, bottles, medicine glasses, photographs, and local history. The book is a collector's catalog featuring history and photographs from the 1850s through the 1970s of Sonoma County druggists and the bottles that were used in their trade. John is a bar management consultant based in Santa Rosa, assisting bar owners in setting up and furnishing establishments and providing curriculum development for bartending schools across the United States. John has been active in publishing and developing bar management publications, as well as authoring a book and regular columns directed at working bartenders. He's a member of the Northwestern Antique Bottles Collectors Club and an acknowledged authority on Santa Rosa's Grace Brothers Brewery. He is also an active supporter of local historical organizations and activities. And before I hand it over to John, I just wanna remind our participants that tonight's presentation, that throughout tonight's presentation, our participants on Zoom are, have their video and their audio disabled, but you will be able to ask questions in our chat room by keying in your questions in that chat room throughout the presentation. We will stop for Q&A after John's presentation is done, and we're also being joined on Facebook Live simultaneously. So our participants on Facebook can key in their questions into the comment section and our administrator on Facebook will be sharing those questions with us here on Zoom. So thank you everyone for attending this wonderful presentation put on by none other than John C. Burton. And now I will hand it over to him. Thank you, John, thank for you. being here. My pleasure, thank you. Uh, so we go into the first slide. There you go. There you go, okay. Frank Sternad was, I actually started this book and I had about 12 to 15 years into it, came to a halt for a while, like a lot of uh, people that write books. And then I remembered my good friend, Frank Sternad, and he is a former druggist and he actually embellished this book to where way beyond what I had ever dreamed of. 
And a lot of the technology we see here and the illustrations come from his collection as well. And this particular slide here will show the tops, the designs and styles of the bottles. And as you can see, this bottle here is New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and actually Whitehall and company was one of the major bottle makers for drug, drug bottles. Okay, next. Are we going to, there we go. This here is, shows the embossed. Embossed means that's where you see on the bottle written in script uh, who the pharmacy is, maybe the address or what uh, uh, down at the bottom of the slide on the apothecary symbols. Uh, I learned a lot what those symbols meant uh, anywhere from a half fluid ounce up to 16 fluid ounces on the bottles. Uh, bottles talk to you. Well, maybe that's one of my problems. I talk to my bottles a lot, but the good news is I only have about 1,200. So I've learned a lot with Frank. At, uh, you can see the symbols, the one ounce bottle, the two ounce bottles, just by the abbreviations on the bottle. On the bottom, many times it had the manufacturer, uh, the patent date of the bottle as well. So that's how we, as uh, collectors get to take and figure the year that these bottles came out. Next, please. Dose glasses. <clears throat> well, if we were in the bar business, the upper left, that would be called a shot glass in my business. But in the medical field, that is called a dose glass. And a lot of the local pharmacies in Santa Rosa uh, as well as Petaluma and other count, uh, cities in our county, the druggists would give these out as advertisements, just like in the bar business, they would give uh, tokens out to get you back into your into their store. Well, the same thing happens here, is that you kept this dose glass from your particular druggist with their names on it. It was their best advertisement. The bottom dose glass, medicine glass, is actually much rarer. And I was very fortunate to get one with Haman Drugstore on it about uh, six months ago off of uh, eBay. And uh, so it's one of my price uh, uh, possessions that I have as well. Going to the next, if you would, shows uh, more medicine glasses. Uh, the bottom three, well, we see Petaluma. Uh, the book tonight, we're really focusing on Santa Rosa, but the book does encompass uh, Guerneville, Geyserville, Petaluma, Sonoma, all cities in the county. But uh, Santa Rosa is our main focus for this evening. And dose glasses are extremely rare, very rare. Uh, one thing about bottles, bottles in, are very rare when... I also collect coins, and if anybody's a coin collector out there, they know like the 1909 S VDV penny is rated as very rare, but I could go tomorrow and probably buy 50 of them just if I had the money. Bottles, when we say rare, we're talking about one or two of that particular bottle. Uh, and most of the time, a lot of these bottles, if you find half a dozen, you really found a treasure to help trade off. Next, please. C.D. Frazee. He was one of the earliest Santa Rosa uh, druggists that uh, put together a lot of bottles. Uh, he was easy to follow. The Press Democrat and the Sonoma Democrat uh, today give so much information online. When I first started this, I had to go through the microfiche and you would walk out of the library dizzy from that. But today you can go online, California digital newspapers, and just about pick up anything you want. It's a fabulous business that they offer. So C.D. Frazee, uh, he was at 611 4th Street. <clears throat> However, one thing to relate when you do history in a town like Santa Rosa, uh, it might be 611 4th Street in 1884, and the addresses do change with time because of the 1906 earthquake, uh, which definitely uh, changed a lot of addresses. But 
The city also changed the names of streets and the addresses. So you really have to follow through when you're doing the history. And if you go to the next, please. Here's some of his bottles. You notice they're all the same style. Uh, they were just different uh, sizes. Uh, the embossment up on the top where you see that script there was C.D. Frazy. It has an F in there, not a T. And uh, everybody had their quote monogram. And of course he had his chemist. Sometimes they list the bottles as chemists, sometimes pharmacists, sometimes pharmacy, sometimes drugstore. Uh, for us bottle collectors, you know, I kind of think we just grouped them all together. But these were some of the earliest Santa Rosa bottles that were dug in Santa Rosa, I believe down at the, 1972 when uh, the mall was coming in. There was a big club dig down there at that time. Thank you, next. Here we go. Here's what we, we identify and catalog the bottle on. We see the monogram, as CD Frazy, uh, Chemist, Santa Rosa. We, it's a clear oval shape, tool top, uh, and then the height. There's four and three quarter inches tall. There's five and three quarter, there's six inch. And those were clear bases, or they might've had a base with the white hall on the bottom of it. And then the H normally came from a location where the glass factory was located. And then the one that I also have at six and three quarter inches tall on the base, it just says four. Uh, and you, you can just about make anything out of that number that you really choose to make out of it. Thank you. Hammond, oh, Paul Hammond, probably one of the most famous or recognized local uh, druggist, pharmacist. Uh, this particular photo here is where there is urban renewal taking place right now at Courthouse Square, right next to where the uh, exchange tower is with the bank with the tower. And Hammond, uh, I believe the Hammond family still quite uh, involved in Santa Rosa locally, descendants. And we have a lot of items from there and they just started locally, I would say eight months ago when they started to dig up that site. I have some friends that are also uh, metal detectors and they went and pulled some early coinage off of that property as well. You know, so we're not just bottle collectors, we get into tokens, we get into coins, we get into any artifacts as possible. Thank you, next. Here's the Occidental Hotel, circa 1908, building and ups, drugstore. It's on the left of side of Keegan Brothers. Keegan's was very big, even when I just came into Sonoma County in 1954. They were located at 443 4th Street. And building and up also uh, were in Guerneville as well. And then up also was into Grayton. There is a bottle of Ups Drugstore out of Grayton, which is extremely rare, it's a paper label. And as you would imagine, paper labels don't survive that well. Uh, as collectors, when we get paper labels, we normally get them out of walls. In other words, back in the days when the carpenters were building these homes and offices, uh, at the end of the day, they would put their beer bottle or any other bottles or artifacts in the wall then sheetrock over it tomorrow. And that's uh, with urban renewal, how we find a lot of uh, uh, rare things at that particular time. Beautiful downtown Santa Rosa. You know, you look at that and it's just, I look at Santa Rosa today and it's certainly a different Santa Rosa by all means. That's why the, I've, I'm so strong with the historical society to keep this alive. Next please. Inside of Belden and Up, on the uh, left here is Belden, and on the right is Up. Uh, they, uh, they were inside the Occidental Hotel building, as you just saw. And they sold to Walter Claypool. Uh, and as we progress, uh, uh, Claypool, when he passed away, his wife took it over, and she was uh, one of the 
actually the third lady pharmacist in the county. Uh, the first one was in uh, Sebastopol, and then Healdsburg, and then Santa Rosa. And you just look inside these stores, they're so magnificent compared to what we see today, starting with the counters, with all the display. <clears throat> uh, again, they had a branch store in Guerneville in 1910 to 1915. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Nix. Here we are in the family drugstore of Paul Hallman, the uh, first photo that you saw. Notice how they're dressed. I mean, compared to what we see today, there's just no contest. You know, uh, everybody today, you go to some of these stores, it looks like they just got done gardening and came to work. Whereas these gentlemen are truly made for the business. It was the gentleman's world in that day uh, because everybody was a more of a class act. But look at all the product and look at the display cases. Uh, they're fabulous display cases. On the bottom left, or excuse me, the bottom right, I have a display case like that in my house that uh, the Sonoma County Library was going to throw away, but I salvaged that and it's in my home and I just treasure that. Look at all the bottles on the top left. It's just, uh, and these gentlemen, they didn't just, uh, they had to have the knowledge to make the prescriptions. They had to follow through on that. Uh, they were the artists. They were the chemists as well as out at the front counter. Thank you. Next. Ah, Herman, if I can pronounce his last name, I'm going to go Ruche. He purchased the Goldberg drugstore. I was amazed how many drugstores we had in Santa Rosa with various names. And a in that time, drugstores also sold alcohol, strictly for medicinal, of course. But uh, Henry here, or Herman Henry, he uh, actually uh, was indicted for uh, selling alcohol during Prohibition. During Prohibition, you know, we remember we had the bootleggers. And uh, the word bootlegging comes from Basically, the women would traffic the alcohol to their clients in, I believe you call them like a pedal pusher type of pants with pockets in them. And that's where they put all the pints of alcohol in them. And you had to get a license from him, which was $2. And then the bottle was $2 as well. But the license was good once you had that license to buy from that particular pharmacy. Uh, it was good for life until the end of Prohibition. So Herman Henry here, he, he had some poor judgment in 1930, sold to the wrong people, but he was not the only one. A lot of our local restaurants at that time, especially down on the uh, Italian side, was uh, had a lot of problems because alcohol was bootlegged in. And of course, in those days, if you who you knew, meant you either got cited or you didn't get cited. It was, uh, I collect Grace Brothers items and uh, in the bottom of the Grace home on, on uh, uh, McDonald Avenue, there was, just, was loaded with oyster shells in the basement because oysters were very big with beer during prohibition and you couldn't walk in the basement without <laughs> as you walk through. Next, please. Ah, here we go. The People's Drug Store. This was on Exchange Avenue, west side of the plaza. Probably the easiest for some of you older plant, uh, members, uh, if you remember where the Miramar was. Well, that's where these gentlemen were, the People's Drug Store. And Ray Reedy, he was also, he had some problems with the legal system as well. Uh, and he, I believe, got caught uh, dealing drugs uh, through his drugstore without a license at one time. It was a little, and that, I believe, was in the Sebastopol area. But again, I love this photograph. Uh, the Sonoma County Library has some great photos that when you research, brings brings the whole subjects to life here. Uh, you can see the People's Drugstore in the center. 
And on the far left, you can see the sign for Paul. Uh, I believe it's Holman there on the drugs on the far left. And please notice the small building there on the right. Uh, I have to get a little closer. I don't have my glasses on, but that's uh, where the uh, right next to it where the people says that's where it's being dug up today. Next, please. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Leslie, that you lived in the St. Rose area. Well, they took a heavy hit during the earthquake in 06. And this was the St. Rose drugstore. And believe it or not, it's one of the few buildings that, quote, survived uh, in Santa Rosa during the earthquake. 95% uh, of the businesses, I believe, were destroyed in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa took a hit worse than San Francisco did on the earthquake because we got the whip of it. San Francisco, the big problem with, was, of course, the fires. But uh, in Santa Rosa, the St. Rose, and, his, and at this particular time, a lot of the St. Rose bottles that we find are all cracked, broken. It's a very rare bottle to find. Yes. Next, please. Inside here, William McKay Stewart, uh, he was the proprietor at the time. And this is what it looked inside of that uh, drugstore. Pretty similar that they all had pretty close to the same design, very long, narrow buildings, uh, cabinetry on both sides, and of course, well-dressed people. Now you see that lady in there and uh, I should have done a little research before I got here. She was the sister-in-law of Stuart, and she was also a druggist in Sebastopol, one of the first that we had uh, ladies there. But again, you can see they sold everything. They sold the medicine. Of course, they sold cigars, <laughs> you know, just like uh, one hand kind of helped the other, I guess. I don't know. So next one, please. These labeled cartons here were for various types of powders. I received uh, probably, I don't know, about 40 different ones of these celery and nervine types of powders from different uh, local stores uh, in Sonoma County. And actually they came from the Franchetti collection uh, when they were getting rid of a lot of their pharmacy items from Michael Franchetti's collection. And I was fortunate to get quite a few from uh, John Franchetti uh, with this. This would have had a powder in it. And this is probably where you would have used that dose glass to measure your powder into it. And then from the dose glass into a glass like an Alka-Seltzer, and then add water to it, stir it, and this would guarantee these. It was amazing. These products would guarantee you everything from toenail fungus to cancer to tuberculosis to headaches to rheumatism. You name the product, you name it, that product would solve your problem. That's why in 06, we got into pure food loss, to be honest with you. Next one, please. This is that dig in 1972 uh, that our club was involved in. Uh, it was down looking west of the Elks building when the Elks were big in Sonoma County at the, or Santa Rosa. They're still large in Petaluma area. But uh, here are some of our early members. And unfortunately, uh, half of them are deceased at this time. But uh, Santa Rosa just leveled everything because the mall was the end all answer to some Santa Rosa economy. The freeway, I believe, was slated to originally go through Stony Point Road, but the local businessmen were afraid that it would take away business of people not coming through Santa Rosa. So uh, the powers that be, we destroyed some great places down there, great stores. Next one, if you would, please. Tomaskos. Uh, this one was around until 1975. So, uh, fortunately, 
uh, had been in it. But they started in uh, to Moscow's pharmacy till 1935, and then they were bought out. And uh, Franchetti was involved all of a sudden into this, and uh, to Moscow and Franchetti uh, from 1935 to 75. And again, the window display. Uh, in those days, I believe you could display your drugs. Uh, today, I don't think it would be. Uh, a thing that you truly want to do. You'd be buying a lot of glass, believe me. Next one, please. War Boys. War Boys, again, same scenario. Long, deep store. Cabinets on the left and the right. Uh, just uh, the big shelves behind them. They were chemists. You see where the, one of the advertisements on the left, they were selling tar soap. Well, uh, they, uh, on the next sh shot there, I think we have a lot of, uh, war boy bottles that are in here. If we go to the next, yeah, uh, war boys, again, basically the same design, just different size bottles. As we go up the line, they did have a couple of, uh, couple of bottles that are brown and, uh, blue. And when we get into the colors, then the value of the bottle goes dramatically higher. And I think in our next uh, film, we might show there's, there's one of my favorite bottles because the color just stands out. Uh, look at the embossment on there, the War Boys Druggist, Santa Rosa, California. Again, shows who the pharmacist is. It shows the location of the city. And... This one here is uh, three and a half inches long. This one belongs to, well, Helm and Deanna Jort. They live in Petaluma, great collectors of bottles and great supporters of our organization. And the one that's not shown, mine is uh, four and a half inches. So they came in different styles, different shapes as well. Next, please. There's War Boys in the Blue. Now, this is a tough bottle to get a hold of. The colors are always the one that people want. And fortunately, this comes in three different sizes. Uh, the tooled oval top here. Uh, the tops also changed probably about 1920. The, we would start seeing different style tops. On the bottom base is uh, Whitehall as well, the company, and then the one USA. Uh, again, the bottle companies, uh, glass manufacturers, that was how they identified. And they, was, they would sell these bottles normally 144 in a case. So you would buy a gross at a time. So sometimes 144 bottles like this particular bottle, if that's all they bought in one particular size, through the earthquakes, through handling, and through recycling, they're pretty rare, very, very rare. Next, please. There's another War Boys, different shape. This is more rectangular. Uh, Dan Brown is the bottom. I just talked to Dan yesterday. He's a major bottle collector, also out of Petaluma. He does a lot of uh, displays at the uh, Petaluma uh, Historical Society down there at the Petaluma Museum. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is just a different shape bottle. Could have been... Uh, a little bit later than the earlier bottles that you just saw. Next, please. Oops, our next event. This is where we were. John, I think, I think that might be your last slide. Oh, uh, well, okay, I was ready for more. <laughs> I, I was too. Yeah. Yes, okay. I definitely uh, was too. Well, that's no problem. Just to mention that uh, the book we just show of Santa Rosa here, uh, you know, one of the slides that we missed was the one of the earthquake on 4th Street. Uh, oh, okay. Was, yeah, that was one of, I won't say a favorite uh, slide, but. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that one um, got transferred. Sorry well, about that. Very, yeah, the book is available online through Amazon and uh, believe it or not, through Walmart, uh, which surprises me. <laughs> I guess Walmart sells anything and everything. 
but uh, yeah, I enjoyed, you know, I really learned a lot doing these. I'm very, I feel knowledgeable about whiskey, soda, seltzer bottles, but by bringing Frank Sternad into this, I learned a lot myself on the uh, drugstore bottles. And like I say, I probably was into this about 10 years and kind of gave it up for a while. Frank had actually, him and uh, George Pedersen, I believe, in 1972, did a four-page pamphlet of listing of bottles in Sonoma County. And that was kind of my inspiration because at that time, Frank had nothing to work with. I mean, copy machines and you know, computers were basically non-existent. And he really increased this. There was some great photos that we that are Franks that are in the book that didn't show here tonight that I, I feel would have really enhanced a bit. Yeah. Well, John, yeah. this is just an amazing amount of information. And I, I didn't let you uh, know this beforehand, but I'm a little bit of a collector of the glass bottles that have been broken <laughs> and into yeah. the sea glass. Um, and of course, you know, the color on sea glass, uh, those colors are um, always more sure. desirable as well. But as I look at this, boy, I tell you, it, it breaks my heart to know that so many of these bottles were broken, whether it be uh, in the earthquake or, you know, maybe by use or, uh, you know, recycling, like you said. Or, yeah. yeah. And ending, ending up in our, in our landfills, which, you know, then end up sometimes right. on our on our beaches and whatnot those pieces uh it's it's wonderful to know that yourself and frank and uh dan brown that you mentioned and and many yeah. others richard siri rick siri yeah have John these collections yeah. how many how many collectors would you say are here in sonoma county you know there's a lot of closet collectors the ones that okay. don't join the clubs and uh, Donna Bourne, I see, is uh, just made a notation there. I love her, former mayor of Santa Rosa. And uh, I always appreciate she gave me a Grace Brother coat. So I have to mention that, one of the driver's <laughs> coats. Terrific lady, uh, terrific lady. But you're right. Uh, as number of collectors, our club is about 30 members that are regulars. And I would say when we go to flea markets, garage sales, estate sales, we run into another 50 plus. Uh, yeah. there will be, there's actually a bottle show in Antioch this Friday and Saturday. And a lot of our club members set up and sell their duplicates there. And then on Sunday, there's the Petaluma Street Fair, which is big. It starts at eight o'clock. So we'll be there at five. And uh, that's the way it is. You get there very early or you just don't go. And uh, yeah. so that's how we find most of these. Uh, but street fairs are good. Antique shows, bottle shows. I do well on bottles at uh, uh, beer can shows. And because beer can shows kind of a go with, there's not many bottle collectors. Where bottle shows, I do well getting beer cans. So I'm kind of going against the grain at both, I do well. And uh, beer cans, I collect Grace Brother beer cans, and I have pretty much the whole set of them. Oh, that's great. Well, let me, you know, the questions have been piling in here. They're just yeah. steaming in. So let me I hope get I to can a, answer them as best yeah, I can. Yeah, let's get to a few of these questions. We've got, Cher Ennis is here and she's over, I know, uh, over in the West End area. And she said that she dug up a bottle uh, in her backyard. Uh, it was embossed with Hamlin's wizard oil. Do you have any information about Hamlin's? Yeah, that oil. One? Well, if you want to give out my email address, I'll be happy to trace down anything. You got to remember on uh, what's, where she's on the West side. Yeah, that uh, the West End neighborhood, I believe. Okay, relate there. That's an early site, and the trains were going through there. So we have a lot of bottles that uh, are quote thrown away or brought into that particular area. That could be from Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, because it was a train stop, 
and everybody got off there and unfortunately their garbage was thrown on the side or somewhere and i would imagine if she dug up the one bottle if she dug a little deeper she'd probably find a few other bottles as well there you go yeah, yeah. And but send me an email we can uh we can trace that down pretty easily oh john what is your email address if you'd like to share do you want to share that email address with everybody sure, please yes okay and um i have your email address so i will be while you're answering the next question, I will be entering that into our chat so that everybody can see it. That would be um, but I'll I'll get you started on the next question here. It's from Karen Stone. And um, oh. wow, she has some she has some information I think that you're going to love. Okay. Uh, she said that she uh, inherited a fair amount of pharmacy memorabilia from her father. Now uh, that actually Karen is relating some information from an email that she got through the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. So it's not Karen's father, but it's a, it's a person who uh, wrote in this email saying that she was the daughter um, of a pharmacist and a partner of the Tomasco drug wow, and yeah. the French Betty. Yeah. There you go. So this person inherited a fair amount of pharmacy memorabilia from their father and some date back as early as the 1900s um, or the in the early 1900s. And she considered donating to the Sonoma County Museum, but was kind of tipped off that they might sell some of these instead of uh, you know, an exhibit. Yeah. 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 Uh, so she would love yeah. to see it all stay together. And if possible, um, you know, have it to have it be with someone that loves it. Um, some of what she has, just so you know, the scales uh, and weights. You can see. That's my front room, if you can see it. Well, you said you had 1,200 bottles, right? Yeah. Is that what you said? I've got um, bedrooms wall to wall. Uh, pretty, we love them, but she's exactly correct. I, back in 75 to 1980, donated some Luther Burbank items to the uh, Sonoma County Museum, and they sold them. And in 1985, uh, Richard Siri, myself, and other collectors, we did a display at the Sonoma County Museum for about three months. And when we went to pick our stuff up, some was missing, some was uh, broken. And I don't really, I know that's 30, 40 years ago, but it's still uh, us collectors, we just shy away from them. Uh, we do put on displays. Uh, that's the neat thing. Uh, we put on displays, local displays. And someday in all truth with this organization, I would love to open my house up uh, to uh, come and view it. Uh, it's a museum. I've had the uh, Antique Roadshow through the house. I've had uh, uh, San Francisco Historical Society, Sonoma County, and, Marinka, you name a museum, a historical society, they've gone through my home. And uh, it's, it's a hard house to dust, let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, I can see you spending a lot yeah. of time doing that, John. I think you'd rather go out yeah. and hunt, hunt the bottles than dust the bottles, right? Yeah. And the other thing is, is in her situation, I would be happy to come over and just evaluate it for her uh, if she chooses to sell it and there's always buyers or if she wants to donate it we can find the right place for it to go as well one thing our club unfortunately we're we're like i say small and most of us are older I mean, i'm 82 years old and i'm young in the club and we've always felt that it would be so cool to have all societies join together and put on a great Sonoma County display that just changed all the time. And uh, it'd be a private display, but on the other hand, it would be all the collectors would love to participate. We truly want to show off our collections, uh, but it's difficult. Understandable, <laughs> understandable. Yeah. So Jennifer Tarara also asks if you have uh, any bottles from the Hall Brothers Drug Company. Uh, yes. That was at 529 4th Street, and that was actually her family. Uh, I have two paper label bottles for there. They are listed in the book. 
uh, yeah, Hall brothers, uh, I think maybe three, two or three bottles that I have for that. Yeah. And you said that those paper labor bottles, the how Harvard. in the world did those get saved, right? Well, you know, as strange as it seems, it's people, there are some people that are from the Depression era that never threw anything away. Okay. And uh, again, as I said, we find them in walls uh, with urban renewal. Uh, I mean, we go to great lengths to find, I'll give you another secret on tins, like beer cans, etc. Well, they are, they originally start on sheets that are six feet long and about two and a half feet wide. And they were printed with X number of beer can faces on it before they were cut and rolled. Well, when there was an overrun or misprints, then they were folded on the inside and then they became heating ducts. So during urban renewals, when we see an era, the area that is being uh, removed, we go in and we open up, try to look in the heating ducts. I, I, I have a bad habit when I go into old stores, I just start staring at their heating duct, hoping I can see a, a little crack in it maybe. You know? Not that I know what I would do, but I'd try my darndest to get it. Yeah. Next question, please. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just got to pass on Donna's fine words about you talking about how magnificent you are and uh, obviously uh, authority on beer memorabilia. She's talking about how Nancy would be so proud and so is she and um, moving right along. This is yeah. a little plug for the Sonoma County Finding History Day that's going to be on August 6th at the Finley Center. So everybody remember that, put that on your calendars. And uh, it sounds like, John, you're going to be there with some of We're your collection. There, yes. Yeah. And hopefully we can do uh, uh, not just a display, but maybe do a couple of talks on bottles as well and other memorabilia. Yes. Well, that, that is wonderful. And thanks, Ray Johnson from the Sonoma County Historical Society for reminding us about that important day. So August 6th <laughs> at the Sonoma County um, Finding History Day, which will be at the Finley Center uh, out there on, on um, what is that, College and, and Stony Point. So right. uh, we're, looking, we're looking forward to that, really. Yeah. yeah, that'll be a great, that'll be a great event. Um, I I believe it's the same that they did at the Ivy Turk barn uh, five years ago, probably. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That was that was really good. Um, I'm looking forward to it once again. And Jennifer wanted to go on and say that um, Theron Errol Hall and his brother Lowell Harry Hall were the pharmacists at the 529 Fourth Street. Um, they were cousins to her father, uh, yeah. and their father was a brother to her grandfather, David W. Hall. So, um, Matt, Jennifer and, uh, and Cher, just about everybody's going to want to, you know, talk to you. Um, and of course we had, um, Karen relate that email to us about, uh, the person that, had some of that memorabilia. So I'm hoping that we can get John's email out to that person so that, because he did say he put it on recording right here. This is also going to be on YouTube, everybody. So if you need to go back and you need to hear what John said again about any of these bottles or about his collection, this will be posted on YouTube. We are recording it tonight. So uh, as you head over to, to the YouTube channels, just look up uh, the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, and you'll see this recording uh, about 24 hours from now or so. We'll try to get that uploaded for you. Um, but it's a great resource, and you might want to watch it again in the future, as well as some of the other videos from our previous webinars. So, um, but that email address I did put in the chat area, and Correct. that was John C. Burton at msn.com. Uh, so, also want to pass on from Michael von der Porten. Uh, that was a bad word to a person my age. You know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, but I'm, I, you're probably familiar with Michael, um, Michael von der Porten. Right. And in Healdsburg, Frank Korik 
was the partner in the pharmacy business with Percy and then Meese. Um, are there any bottles known from those firms that you are. are aware of? Yeah. Okay. We just lost your audio there, John, or I did. You're not muted. So I'm not really quite sure what happened. Everybody, we're gonna wait for John to get back up. Oh, I think I hear you again now. We're there. We're there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You. Okay. You got it. Okay, great. So you were going to tell us about the the Percy or the the me. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. My, my personal collection is on medicines is basically Santa Rosa and Healdsburg. Uh, Dan Brown is huge collection of Petaluma. We kind of everybody, you know, it depends where you live, what you collect. But, uh, and once again, if anybody gets in touch with me, they want to come by. I'm semi retired now. I'd be more than happy to show off anything that I have. You're welcome to come to the house. Not a problem. Uh, and back to the Hall brothers, I believe uh, that we also have some, a uh, couple of photos of family in there as well. So you have just about, you have a little bit of everything, it sounds like. Yeah, um, right. We wanted to, you know, the book is 320 pages. You know, and just. Um, Where can they find that book at, John? Uh, well, Amazon okay. uh, is probably the best. It's printed by Ingram Sparks. I believe they're out of Tennessee. And uh, then also I like Barnes and Noble. Actually, the best way is just go online. Okay. And type in the title and it'll come up. And John C. Burton uh, will bring it together. You'll probably see uh, there's seven books on there that I've got. The Marin bottles, Napa bottles, Mendocino uh, Santa Rosa, Sonoma County, and I just finished, just got another one, just printed yesterday, is uh, uh, pre-prohibition uh, beer labels of California breweries, which we just did. It's, it's full color. That's the other nice thing. These books are full color when they, uh, some of them, there's great. I noticed there was a question about, I think, think uh what will happen to my collection is, is, is that one of the questions i saw down below there it could be it could be one of the questions why don't you go ahead and answer that and then i'll go back to facilitating the questions while you answer that about your collection i'm going to actually be uh keying in the title of your book uh okay. your and both your and frank's name as well as uh, where they can potentially sure. get that. I won't include any links, everybody, but at least you'll be able to uh, copy and paste this into Google or into Amazon or something like that if you're looking for to get that book. Right. Well, basically what will happen to my collection, will, my youngest daughter will uh, be handling that when the time comes. Uh, my beer can collection, uh, which is Grace Brothers, uh, about 150 different grace cans, all pretty close to being mint. They, there's a couple of collectors that are mentioned that they have first option at it. On my bottles, the same thing. I've designated uh, certain people in my trust that they get first uh, to embellish their collections as well. Uh, my postcard collection, uh, it will probably... That, that's a good one. I, I'm not quite sure what will happen to that because a lot of the cards are for spe specific areas. Like I have a couple of great Grace Brother cards that uh, are about 1905. And I'm sure GB collectors would be really after that. Uh, it's amazing. My friends come over and they kind of analyze uh, my collection. You know, everybody's kind of 
parting it out in their mind, I guess. And uh, which is fine. We all do the same thing. We've lost a lot of great collectors in the last three years. And so the collections are coming into our area more so than not. Yeah. So you're able to pick up a few more of those bottles every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. True. Right. Yeah. Well, here's a great question that Karen got and passed on to us uh, about the color of the bottles. You were talking about how the colors uh, <clears throat> meant that they were more rare. But also, right. what does that mean when they were being used? Do you know that? Well, actually, it comes from the sand, oh, the, mag okay. the magnesium in the sand. And then that's why you see some of these bottles that are outside that are purple. It's the magnesium. When Pacific Coast Glassworks first started in San Francisco, uh, they were using sand from the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco. Cisco Oakland and the bottles were very crude, terrible bottles. So they started getting sand from down in the uh, San Jose area, which is a better sand for the glass. And then they were even importing sand from Europe, believe it or not. And so it is the components of the sand will take and make the color of the bottle. Now, do you know if the color of the bottle differentiated if it was a harmful substance in the bottle? It was a what, I'm sorry? So if, let's say that if you had a harmful sub substance, would that be in a more colorful bottle, let's say? Oh, I'm, uh, it was just a sand color that worked. Okay. Uh, made it a more secure bottle. And of course the, uh, colored bottles are more rare and more expensive as well. This particular War Boys that is still on the screen, clear. Oh, what size is that? If that's like a five inches, uh, that could go anywhere from five to fifteen dollars. If it were that brown one that we saw earlier, now it goes from maybe twenty-five to forty-five dollars. So color really, uh, color talks. Uh, everybody wants the color is uh, more of a window bottles. You'll see a lot of our collectors, even nondescript bottles will put on window sills just to get the, the array of colors. And there are certain bottles that uh, more so in sodas that like Bay City sodas is like 15 colors for the same bottle. So there's certain people that will collect that one bottle only, but want to have all the various colors. Uh, they call it a run. And it's a run of colors that they're very happy and proud of. Mostly those are pre-1900 for the great colors. Yeah. The cobalt. Cobalt is expensive. Other than bromo seltzer bottles. I went to an antique store in Healdsburg and I told my like bottles, she brought me a Clorox bottle. Like, you know, it's like a Billy <laughs> Beer can. <laughs> but she tried. Well, here's a question. I believe it might be from Facebook, um, from one of our Facebook participants. And thank you for those participants that are on Facebook and watching us live right now simultaneously as we're uh, broadcasting this webinar on Zoom. Um, and this question asks if the early druggists were exposed to components that may have poisoned them before there was any knowledge that the ingredients would be detrimental to their health? Very, very interesting question because as we went through uh, doing our research, so many of the chemists, pharmacists were dying at age 35 to 45 years of age. And yes, they, they were probably dealing with something they didn't really fully understand at the time. But that is true. It just seems to be like 70% of them died in, you know, pre-40 in that, in that era. Very, and that's why there were so many changes from uh, a drugstore, I think in Cloverdale, there was a drugstore that sold like three times in one year that the pharmacist died, you know. He could have been on his own product too, you know, who knows? Right, now, and I'm curious, I mean, there, 
from your presentation, there were just so many drug stores and pharmacies so close to each other, <clears throat> really clustered in Santa Rosa. Yes. And why do you do you have any idea why that was from your research? Well, actually, most of the towns were small. Uh, you take like Cloverdale, Hawkwind, uh, Guerneville, you know, they were very small, almost villages per se, and just great competition. I don't know. Everybody seemed to have an illness of some form. And you have to, I would think that hospitalization was not like it is today. I would also say that uh, these pills and medicines were advertised to cure anything that you ever thought you had. And people were, you know, there was just a terrific market for it. Terrific market for it. I would say at one time that uh, drugstores rivaled the number of saloons in Santa Rosa at one time. Saloons, of course, there were probably twice as many, but uh, at one time, Santa Rosa had like 30 saloons at the same time and probably 12 drugstores. It's just fascinating. Sometimes, I, maybe times haven't changed too much if you think about it. Oh, know? that's just true. We do have a lot of drugstores inside of other stores at yeah. this point. So, right. um, but, you know, Elaine Huth here has uh, a question and she actually was asking earlier about the time of uh, that event that's going to be over at the Finley Center on August 6th. So uh, I believe it's 10 to, 10, to, 10 to 2 or 10 to 4. Yeah, I think it is all day too. But if we get information um, from Ray on that, if Ray, you're still with us and you want to put that in the chat area, we'll share that as well. Um, but Elaine also had a question that if there are certain people um, in Sonoma County who specialize in soda fountain memorabilia. Now, drug stores okay. and soda fountains went together at a certain point in our history, right? Yes, yes. I specialize in, in what we call hutch bottles, Hutchison bottles and crown tops and things of that nature. Oh, we notice it's 10 to 2, by the way, for the historical on uh, the uh, August 6th. Great. But, uh, yeah, I have the largest uh, Sonoma County soda bottle collection and uh, seltzer bottles as well. So you, you you've literally do have a little bit of everything. I think no, everybody's I got a lot be... of everything. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. Well, this is true. You do have a lot of everything. You said 1,200 bottles that you have. And I also remember right at the beginning of the presentation or near to it, you uh, talked to, you said that bottles talk to you um, uh, and, you know, not only because they do. They're, they're inscribed and the information that are on those bottles, but I'm sure over time you've learned, like you said, the different, the different shapes oh. of the bottles, the different tops of the bottles, those kinds of things all have a meaning, right? Exactly. The first bottle that I ever had interest in was I found a bottle that it was a soda bottle, a crown top, and meaning it had a cap on it. And it said Santa Rosa Bottling Company, Rose City. And my wife was in uh, on the city council or something in the city government at that time. And for her, I was like, wow, Nancy. That's interesting. I didn't know that Santa Rosa was known as Rose City. I always thought it was Portland. So I gave her that bottle just because. But about three days later, I took it away from her because it just got to be more intriguing to me. And from that point on, I just bloomed. I saw another bottle. And then I all of a sudden started learning the history of, of my area, Santa Rosa. And then, of course, it expanded to other cities in our county and into, into San Francisco as well. I also, I just sold to the United States Bartenders Guild. I had uh, the second largest collection of antique bartending books in the United States and at this point, but a lot of them were acid paper. So it was 
for me, a good time to get rid of them because acid paper starts to crumble. But I had the first bartending books that ever came off the printing press back in the 1860s and even one 1841, which was nightcaps. And so I've just always expanded. I attended bar at the Flamingo in Santa Rosa. And that's where I met Tom Grace in those days and the Grace family. Uh, then I went to uh, work for Cotting at the bar he had in Cottingtown for a couple of years. But Los Robles, Klaus Newman purchased it, he and Tony Vicini. And I went begrudgingly there. It wasn't my style of place, but I only stayed about 29 years because it was just something that, you know, I experienced that became terrific. But my customers were all older and talking about the county, and it just drew an interest into me. And of course, then I met Gayla Barron, and then, you know, you might as well throw dynamite in the fire there because it just went wild when I met her and, and started listening to her and seeing the photographs of her husband, John, from his collection and her books. And then uh, Dee Blackman, who they wrote the Santa Rosa books, and it just expanded. I, I was very fortunate. Uh, we did a lot of caterings from Los Robles, so I was lucky to do uh, be kind of in charge of catering. So I got to go into all the old homes in Sonoma County, Santa Rosa. We traveled all over and I just put all that at that time, kind of making mental notes and it just bloomed from there. And I'm glad it did because I feel that myself, you, Ryan, we all have to bring this together and keep this history going because that is part of our life. And they say things go in full circle, you know? So we've seen some of that, but uh, I just, I love Sonoma County. I love the Bay Area. And uh, I just love tradition. You know, I think a lot of older people like tradition. The way it was is more important to us than the way it's going. So I have that. I, and I saw one, I think, from Evelyn there about postcards, you know, or maybe she collects postcards. I've got some great Sonoma County postcards, and I know where there's a fabulous postcard collection of Sonoma and Marin counties. And someday I'm going to have to try to purchase that as, as well. So anything to do with the, is with the county, I'm in there. Believe me, I love it. Yeah. Well, and that is really great. It's great to hear that story about that first bottle that you saw and how that yeah. really ins inspired you to, um, you know, discover the local history. Um, right. There's a lot more history and a lot more avenues right. to discover history, uh, whether it be through bottles or books or through our indigenous uh, populations here in Sonoma County and encourage everybody to find your passion and have it relate to you. Um, and then and then go out and discover that history and resource wonderful people like John Burton that we have with us tonight. Or as John did, he resourced his friend, uh, Frank Sternad, right. and uh, got more information right. from, from Frank. So there are always people out there that have a little bit more information than maybe you have and can become great right. resources and great mentors for us. Exactly. So, all, really, all the books that I've done, I've brought other collectors into it because nobody has everything and especially knowledge. Everybody knows a part. And that's what I believe in is putting these books together, uh, bringing in other collectors, getting them interested and exposing part of their collection as well. I have a very large Sonoma County whiskey collection. And when I talk about a bottle that talks to me, they all have addresses, you know, the model saloon, uh, the grapevine. The grapevine was uh, Herman Bayer and he had the grapevine in 1910. He was riding the, tr and the train coming to Santa Rosa through that tunnel in Marin where they had that horrendous crash where two trains met head on and he was sitting in the club car and a piece of metal 
flew from the outside of the train engine through his mouth and pinned into the car. Yeah, a terrible way to go. But I mean, then, then this bar was sold to Dan Picken. And then through the years, of course, we got prohibition. It became a lunch counter. And then it reopened as the bank club back in the day with Primo Rocco. Uh, so it, all of our industry, our interest is just A to B. We try to catalog that. That address is what we try to catalog as best we can. Yeah. And then we would, love, we would love to do a great Sonoma County display if we had the location, believe me. It would be fantastic. Well, that, that brings up another question that I had. I remember that there was a, a bottle event at the Sonoma County or uh, Santa Rosa Vets Hall uh, one time. I remember, I remember uh -huh. stumbling upon it. Is that something that might come back? Is, was that your group that did that? September 17th and September 18th of this year, we have the vets already reserved. Uh, we do a two day bottle show and we buy, sell, trade. Uh, and it's not just bottles. It could be coffee cans. It could be beer cans, uh, old cash registers, any type of memorabilia, a lot of paper as well. A lot of people like to collect old paper because it's easy to take and store, uh, or if they deal in it, it's easy to mail through uh, through the mail system versus boxes and things of that nature. I mean, so, in your bottle collection group, what is the name of that group? Northwestern Bottle Collectors Association. Northwestern. Yeah, one word: Northwestern Bottle Collectors Association. Right. And that's September 18th and 19th. It's a okay, Saturday everybody. and a Sunday, and Sunday is free. Oh, and Sunday is free. Yeah. You guys are too good. That is awesome. Well, I had just entered that information into the chat area. So September 17th and 18th, folks, um, at the Vets Hall in Santa Rosa. Um, it's John's Bottle Collection Group. So that's what I called it's it at first, but then there's the name of it. <laughs> those guys mad at me. <laughs> you got to call it by the right name when you show up. The Northwestern Bottle yeah, Collectors right. Association. And then just go say hi to, to John. And remember that on Saturday, there is a fee at the door to get in. But on Sunday, you can get in for free. Yeah. Um, I do Saturday remember... $3. $3. Yeah. What a deal. And unless you have early bird, then it's 10. Early bird is from, uh, I believe, 9 to uh, 10 to ten to 12 is early okay. bird, uh, which is cheap. I mean, if we go to a show in Las Vegas. Uh, they sell the tables for $500 per table for each collector to display. I mean, trade shows are not cheap for these uh, collectors. Well, and it's a lot of time and energy to get your whole collection together and then put it on display and then right. and packing up and taking it home and driving. And, you know, it's like that. Oh, a, yeah. week, yeah, a week from Saturday, I'm going to a beer can show in Sacramento. Uh, so I'm pretty active now that the COVID thing is lifted. We're back in action. And then yeah. the price of gas. But other than that, we're happy. There you go. There you go. And I'm sure it takes, I'm sure that you, uh, take care of your bottles it, they're they're well wrapped in order to get them yeah yeah any well, place yeah. yeah yeah well it has been a pleasure john thank you. to hear about your collection and thank you so much for not only sharing your information with us tonight on this webinar but also sharing your time and a contact information so that people can get in touch with you um you're so open you're uh, very accessible um, for folks to get in touch with you and thank you for passing right. your knowledge and your information on to others. Thank you. And like I say, if I don't have the answer, there's members in our club, I can forward you to anywhere from marbles, which is glass. We yep. <laughs> you know, Indian you know, arrowheads, marbles, all the way up to large jugs where, you know, beer cakes. There's, there's somebody that has the knowledge. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, I know that everybody has a, a lot of great words to say, including Denise Hill. 
saying a great presentation. Cher was on earlier saying great presentation. Thank you, Jennifer, for saying thank you. Um, you know, this is something, again, I want to remind folks that this recording uh, of this presentation will be on YouTube. So you can access that by going to the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's website and finding their YouTube link there, which you can see now on the screen, the website address for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa, which I do have to mention that this presentation, we would love for everybody to be members of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. And you can uh, gain membership by going to the website that you see right there on the page. You can also access the newsletters and you will see information about upcoming events. And this is the exciting news, John. As much pleasure as it has been to be with you tonight via this virtual uh, platform, the next event for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa is going to be in person. It'll be the first uh, in-person event in well over a year. And that will be on June 4th at 10 a.m. And it'll be a tour of Juilliard Park and the Church of One Tree, uh, which is a fantastic uh, church uh, down which is now a building. Um, I don't believe that there is any church services in it, but it was the Church of One Tree. Um, and that will be with none other than Bill Montgomery, who is just wonderful. I'm sure he'll wear his top hat for that one and take everybody on that tour of the park and the Church of One Tree. So you can find uh, registration information about that on the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's website uh, coming up soon. So be sure to put that in your calendar and be sure to be checking their website. You can also check them out on Facebook uh, as some of you are watching this presentation on Facebook tonight. And thank you so much for joining us on that platform. So um, we will keep you up to date on the website as to more upcoming events, because now that we have kind of turned a little bit of a corner on the COVID uh, pandemic as we know it, and uh, being a little bit safer here, we are able to open up some of these events. So we much appreciate all of your patience. We appreciate your patronage for coming to these virtual webinars. And we look forward to seeing everybody in person. I wanna thank once again, John C. Burton for your time you. and energy, knowledge and information that you shared with us tonight. And Remind we remember, everybody. Yeah, we will be doing displays August 6th and should anybody want to bring anything there for us to evaluate we'd be more than happy to do it that's great because they can they can find you right there august yes. 6th at the finley center at the uh day of history or the um and that is through the sonoma county historical society and i bet you i have no doubt the historical society of santa rosa will probably be on a table right alongside you there john um making sure that folks know some information about Santa Rosa as well. I hope so. Yeah. 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 So uh, once again, next one, June 4th, it's a Saturday, 10 a.m. It'll be a tour of Juilliard Park and the Church of One Tree with Bill Montgomery. So here's wishing everybody stay safe until then. We'll look forward to seeing you on June 4th and everybody have a great evening. Good night. Thank you.